Hello, everyone. My name is Kungo Wangmo Upshaw, and I'm the acting director of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in Orange County, California. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's virtual library live event. Thank you for inviting us into your homes this evening. First, a little housekeeping. The event is being recorded, and if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. This year's 2021 Library Live Sponsors program has made, is made possible by all the sponsors that you saw on the slideshow, including Greg and Sally Palmer, Todd and Natasha Palmer, Sam and Tammy Tang, and Karen and Bruce Clark, along with dedicated foundation members, ticket holders, and Library Live committee members led by Foundation Board Member Nancy Delfors. Thank you all for making our program possible and helping us fulfill the Foundation's mission of providing funds to purchase valuable digital resources and library catalogs for the Newport Beach Public Library System. You make our library card a powerful tool for all who wield it. Our next event is on Friday, March 12th, with journalist and author Sam Quinones. To find out more about the Foundation and our upcoming programs, please check out our new website, nbplf.foundation. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce Jenny Ophel, author of book Weather, which is a darkly funny tour de force about family, climate change, and addiction. It was shortlisted for UK's Women's Prize for Fiction. You can also now buy the book in paperback. Ms. Ophel is also authored the books Department of Speculation and Last Things. She is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and currently a visiting writer at Bard College. She will be in conversation with Meg Linton, who is the former CEO of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation and independent contemporary art curator, writer, and editor. Take it away, ladies. Oh, oh. thank you all for coming tonight. Um, excited to be here tonight with Meg and with the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. Yes, um, I need to have Kunga give me permission. There oh, we go. There we go. Yay. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks. Yeah. For We're really thrilled to have you here. And um, I, I was telling you earlier during the practice session that um, I first found out about you with our library live committee when they chose you to be one of our authors. Uh, for this season and I hadn't read any of your work. And so I read Weather immediately. And then of course I read all of your books <laughs> in reverse chronology so I could see how you develop this, this amazing style and your, your voice as a writer. Um, and so I thought we would begin tonight uh, because we have audience members, some who have read your work and some who have not. So I thought maybe you could introduce us to your character, our librarian, Lizzie Benson, and give us a little background about her and kind of um, talk about, give us a little intro of the book and some of the subjects, maybe the motherhood, politics, climate ch change, um, and kind of how we learn about all of these things through Lizzie's kind of daily observations and interactions. Um, yes, well, the main character, the narrator of the novel is um, Lizzie Benson, and she has, um, kind of in some ways fallen into a job working in a university library. Um, but it's a job that she loves, partly because she's the kind of person who is very interested in other people's stories. So she's interested in hearing what's going on with her patrons. She's interested in the people that she passes on the street. And she's also um, very much perhaps to a fault, a caretaker for her own extended family, um, including her brother who is a recovering addict and her mother who like so many of us has, has fallen on, on hard financial times. Um, the sort of plot of the novel is put into motion when a former mentor of hers from grad school uh, begins this climate change kind of doom laden podcast. And she asked Lizzie, since she works at the help desk, if she might start answering some of her email for her. And this provides a way for her to kind of for better or for worse dive into um, both apocalyptic strains of American culture, prepper strains, um, religious strains, and all of that is kind of worked into the book, some of it in uh, the question answer format. Um, 
but of course at the same time she's still taking care of her own family that's great um and the way that lizzie kind of works the help desk you know because we're a library we're obviously interested in that she's our, you know the main character is a librarian and uh using the help desk kind of as a vehicle for you to kind of have Lizzie tell these observations and kind of give us hints of these stories. It seems like a lot of the patrons that are coming to her, you get a real sense of their vulnerability and mm -hmm. kind of their sense of, um, you know, what they're tackling with in their day to day life and so forth. And so I was kind of hoping you could talk a little bit about how maybe you collected these stories or how they came to you or did you work a help desk at a library <laughs> um, because you seem to know especially when you talk about the the uh patrons the types of patrons and how to deal with them <laughs> right no i haven't worked in a library um i i mean i i guess i did some book shelving in my university library when um when i was in college but I spend a lot of time in libraries, um, partly because I love them and partly because um, whenever I'm kind of in transit, that's often where I land to try to do my work. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things um, it's, you know, I guess libraries are a place that has always been a happy place for me ever since I was a kid. And one of the things I've noticed over the years is we, we of course think of librarians, um, you know, as smart people, as bookish people, um, but they're also really um, often have to do social work in many ways. And they're really um, tasked with being problem solvers um, for all sorts of things that um, have perhaps fallen apart in their patrons' lives. So a librarian may on a given day be helping someone um, learn how to look up job listings if they've lost a job. They may be helping a newly widowed uh, patron um, find some books. And I feel like it's really, libraries to me are so important because they're really, in our country, they're really the only non-commercial space where everyone is welcome. And, um, and that means that librarians have a lot to deal with, but um, it also means that I think it, it is an institution that is very near and dear to many people's hearts. So that's why I wanted to set the story there. And I felt like it was a way to kind of uh, peer in to a lot of different things that were going on in the world. Um, and it's a city novel, you know, it's set in, it's set in Brooklyn. And um, in, in TV shows, of course, we always have like a hospital or a police station or something like that because the stories come to you. Um, and I've always thought, well, actually, libraries are like that, too. Like, if you sit in a public library or a university library for half a day, you will hear a lot of stories about people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just was a jumping off point for me. Well, can you can you just share like one or two little of those little stories that you've included in the book? Um, yeah. You know, because they do, because it is, you know, I look at this as like it was such a beautiful vehicle to show empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and these these really personal intimate kind of exchanges, even though they're very succinct. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that, that I've noticed, and I think people who work in libraries are really aware of this, is that um, as the um, opioid crisis has sort of spread across our country, um, a lot of libraries now have um, workshops to help people learn how to administer Narcan um, to wow. people in their life. And I remember seeing that at a small town library that I was in. I saw people going into that. And so one of the stories I tell is about um, a, a patron that Lizzie has known well over the years, but doesn't really know anything about her life, except that she has an adult daughter. And at one point, the woman comes in and she hasn't come in in months. and um, and all she says about her daughter is, uh, I left her alone. I went to the store for one minute. And, and what you realize with all these overdue books is that her, that her daughter overdosed. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time she's been able to venture into public afterwards. And, and so I just feel like um, that kind of sadness and that kind of vulnerability um, can be part of your experience working in a library as well as the parts that are really joyful, like a kid getting their first library card or, um, you know, someone sort of discovering it as an as a place to be. Yeah. 
I still have my very first library card. <laughs> <laughs> I think people that, people that there's definitely a librarian, library nerd people who are like, woo, I remember that moment. It was like getting my driver's license. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And it's um, been interesting working at the, the foundation for the last few years. I mean, it's been a little odd because of, because of COVID, but um, seeing people come in and seeing that it's really is a safe space for a lot of people mm -hmm. that are vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I, you know, one of the things I've been watching a lot of your other interviews and so forth for in preparation for tonight. And one of the things that has come up is kind of the topic of denial. And I was also thinking the tension between denial and delusion. Um, and I was thinking in terms of Sylvia, who's another one of your characters. This is who Lizzie's boss, who has a podcast called Hell in High Water. And I was thinking about kind of the opposites that you have kind of facing off with our, with each other, kind of like the, the doomers or the doom, you know, doomsday preppers versus the environmentalists, mm -hmm. um, kind of the atheist versus the evangelical, mm -hmm. um, and kind of how these seemingly polar opposites are also kind of connected in the craziness of the time. And, you know, some people see the world as like, uh, that it can be saved and others see it as completely lost. So I was kind of hoping you could talk about that a little bit in terms of the context of your, of the overall novel, because it shows up kind of consistently throughout. Mm -hmm. I think that tension between hope and despair and whether in fact those are um, polar opposites or it's more of a spectrum you might move between, um, you know, that, that is something I was really trying to explore in this novel. Um, Lizzie, um, when the novel begins, um, as I said, she's a caretaker, but she's definitely not particularly interested in environmental issues more than, you know, a run of the mill person. I think because she feels, um, as a lot of us do, already very taxed. And so she, at one point when she starts to become more and more aware of um, how dire the climate crisis is, you know, she's sort of thinking to herself, Oh, oh no, I have to worry about the whole world too, because it can be once you gain more and more knowledge of it, it becomes harder and harder to look away. And I think the talking about the preppers or the doomers, um, you know, there's some people that insist, no, you may you may never look away from it. You know, it, 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 it's it's wrong to ever look away from it. And there's some people who, who say blithely in some way, like, well, there's nothing we can do, or you have to focus on the present. Um, and I think that uh, I wanted to show someone kind of slowly letting more and more of that knowledge in. Mm -hmm. um, I read a book that really influenced me, a nonfiction book, which um, has the somewhat daunting title, uh, uh, States of Denial, Looking Away from Suffering and Atrocity uh, by a South African writer, Stanley Cohen. But one of the things he talks about, it, he's actually talking about apartheid and, um, and Nazi Germany, but he's talking about the, the beginnings of knowing something that is frightening mm -hmm. and that our very human response is to try not to look at it directly. And that's what denial, and often when we talk about climate change denial, we mean people who say it doesn't even exist. But those people are fewer and fewer far between at this point. I think there's another kind of denial, which is about not feeling the emotional impact of it or being um, fatalistic about it as a way not to think about it. So I just wanted to take Lizzie as a sort of average um, everyday person um, and show what it meant to start having these, frankly, rather existential concerns uh, going back and forth with, you know, remembering to, uh, pick up her son at school and running out to the store to get groceries and helping her mother navigate how to get, you know, dentistry done. And I think so many of us actually toggle between those things. And sometimes um, in many of the novels I'd read, it was either post-apocalyptic climate disaster or it wasn't there at all. Mm -hmm. It really is kind of this day-to-day -day life that kind of carries on. And then you know, and then you have when your book is launched, you know, and then you have the pandemic hit, Yeah. you know, and it seems like the two of um, 
I don't want to say dovetailed beautifully, but it's like, this is kind of an indication of like, we're in the middle of this crisis, but you still have to take, you still have to get your kid to school, whether it's on Zoom, you still have to get your medications mm -hmm. and kind yeah. of how the, the motherhood aspect kind of plays out in the novel too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I did, uh, you know, I, I keep having these reminders as I think all of us are right now of, oh, it was just a year ago that it was, you know, dawning on most of us. And I actually, uh, weather came out in, I think it was um, like mid-February of last year. So I did um, the West Coast part of my book tour um, before anything was, you know, it was funny because there were little hints, but at the time people thought that uh, they were more worried about uh, contamination, you know, contamination. So I remember towards the end of my book tour, uh, people who had hand sanitizer and something, but no one's worried about the air or anything like that. And while of course my novel is not about the pandemic, it is very much about what it means to um, experience dread and what, especially dread of something that is um, you, you half formed, half understood. Um, and because um, COVID was something new, um, there was this very rapid changing of information at all points. And, and I know I, I myself, I, I felt this almost, um, I like to do research anyway, but I felt this like uh, urgent need constantly to, to try to figure out more of what was going on and understand uh, you know, how to uh, keep those around me safe. And so the parts I guess that dovetailed a little bit with the book I'd been writing were, um, I'd written about kind of disaster preparedness and the whole culture of that. And there's a really interesting you know, field really of disaster psychology. And one of the things that I had come across when I was reading about climate was this idea you know, of our normalcy response or also known as our incredulity response, which is that when a disaster happens that we have not experienced before, everything in our brain tries to tell us that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. um, that's why in a tragedy like 9-11, people straightened their desks and, you know, because your brain keeps telling you, no, it's, I haven't seen this before. There's no template for it. As long as we act normal, things will go back to normal. And I did experience that in real time at the beginning of the pandemic that many of my friends who lived in New York were calling me maybe because I had a reputation that was some kind of doomer, um, you know, asking me like, you know, what, what should I, how serious is this? What do you think? And I, of course, um, I didn't know, but I knew that that impulse to freeze is a very human one. And one that uh, disaster psychologists have all are all urging people to, to try to move out of that state of paralysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to move quickly into one of hopefully action. Um, it was kind of interesting because right when, um, just before everything shut down, we had David Wallace Wells come oh, to speak yeah. about the uninhabitable earth. And one of the question, one of the questions towards the end of the program was talking about viruses because we were starting to hear about the coronavirus right at that time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, two weeks later, everything was shut down. And he was talking about how, you know, climate scientists have been predicting that, you know, viruses will start coming and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna shut things down and then all of a right. sudden it's happening. And so it is, even though not the particular disasters you're talking about in your book with your your doomers but um it is something that we're grappling with with the impending no but you're emergency. absolutely right I mean it is it is related to climate change because of also as um not only with temperatures rising but in parts of the world but with people um with development and people encroaching more and more on what have been um animal habitats these sort of uh things that can cross from one species into humans, that's what people have been warning about. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think people who work in public health, it's a very hard job because no one ever knows all the disasters you've prevented. <laughs> you right. know, it's a bit like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult job because basically you do your job correctly, people say you are alarmist. Mm -hmm. And if you do anything short of prevent those disasters, people are like, why did you not prevent us from um, having this horrible thing happen? So it's a, yeah. 
a hard, it's a hard thing. But that book, The Uninhabitable Earth, it was a, um, I read it when I was, I don't know, three quarters of the way through this novel. And mm -hmm. I had, I had thought at different points of integrating more kind of nonfiction material mm -hmm. into it, including some of the, you know, sort of statistical things that he talks about, these sort of frightening facts. But um, I ultimately decided that that it was more important for me as a fiction writer to speak to the kind of um, emotional feel of, mm -hmm. of this crisis because the nonfiction writers are doing a fantastic job in <laughs> out, you know, in, in telling us, you think of someone like um, Elizabeth Colbert or, or um, there's many people that have written incredibly well about the crisis that's upon us. But I think there's also beginning to be a wave, especially of younger writers who are writing about what it means to grow up with this climate uh, fears as a backdrop. And so I think it's, it's becoming more and more integrated into, into arts. And I know, you know, as a curator, I think the visual artists have been way, way ahead. Um, yeah. You know, they've been doing really amazing work about climate for, I'd say a decade at least, if not, if yeah. not much longer. Yeah. Well, and even the earlier work in the 70s with the earth exactly, and yeah. all of that, just pointing pointing information towards these, um, what's happening in the natural world and mm -hmm. so forth, um, whether it's positive or negative. Um, right, and that's really key. <laughs> interconnectedness for better or for worse. Right, um, exactly. Which I think we all felt in a, in a um, kind of strangely sinister way with the pandemic mm -hmm. that everything might harm everything else that every action um you know could have these consequences um but of course that's that is something that people who are ecologically minded have have been trying to say that that no one is an island in this in this particular right respect. and i think that the pandemic too has shown how so yes everyone's integrated through um through nature and just by being human and animals and so forth. But then you look at the industry and you mm -hmm. see how interconnected and then like one part falls and like mm -hmm. you can't get supplies. Right. You can't get, right. you know, and it, it impacts everyone worldwide. So it actually shows it to you on really clearly on the economic forefront. Yeah. And I mean, I just was reading in, I think it was in the times today that there's, uh, we may have a, a, worldwide shortage of um the glass vials for the vaccine because there's there's not enough sand <laughs> you know yes. or, or the, to make the glass and and sort of those things which in everyday life most of us are not necessarily calculating i mean in some ways i think that was part of this disaster that um really did increase people's empathy because uh maybe like being more aware of what someone who's delivering your food or stocking a grocery shelf, um, you know, what, what their life is like and what that might mean um, in terms of if there is things on the shelves or not. I think, I think that was something a lot of us saw more clearly. Right. It's interesting you mentioned the sand because there was a New Yorker article, I would say maybe two years ago, that was talking about sand in the oh, context really? of not being able to find the right sand for beach volleyball oh, set up. I do remember that. Yeah, that it was really fascinating. And then it talks about the whole industry of sand and how you move sand around the globe and all of those things. But then you also start to think about, well, what about all the glass we recycle and where is that going? Because the recycling has slowed down and so forth. Right. So again, that interconnectedness. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things in looking at your book and kind of how you've kind of created this, um, you know, kind of moving through the day to day um, is this style, this fragmented style that you have, where it's really kind of a cross between poetry and prose. Um, but I also think of, you know, uh, some of the early feminist writers and, you know, the idea of making lists and that being a valid form, especially for women dealing with motherhood and how their days are kind of broken up. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it made me think of that. And I know there's been some kind of controversy. Either people seem to really love this kind of style that you have, or they're really kind of railing against it. Like I don't understand. Um, and I just, and you've, you know, you've, it's not necessarily a new form, but you've brought it to such new heights and it's so beautiful. And then you've combined it with this humor so I guess I just I like are you a frustrated like comedic poet or <laughs> you know I just you know I, and how you've come to it it's like is it natural or do you have to really work at it um I think that uh the style which like for those of you who haven't um read uh anything of it, it it's often like sort of you can see it's like written in these little blocks and that's like one of the questions for example um I, I came to the style and it did actually have something to do with um, motherhood because I, I'd written uh, my first novel, Last Things, is it is written in a more linear sense. It looks it looks on the page more conventional. It also had the kind of uh, nested stories that I that I like, but I hadn't mm -hmm. yet decided that I wanted to set things off, which, as you mentioned, you know, is a style that of course has been around a long time, but maybe has not been very ascendant in uh, American literature. It's a little mm -hmm. more common in Europe. And the reason I wanted to use this style was partly maybe because I am a frustrated poet. Um, when I first began to write, I thought about writing poetry, but it was one of those things where, you know, you're 19 years old and the people you're reading are like uh, Wordsworth and Keats and, I, I honestly just felt that it was not possible to be a poet. I mean, mm -hmm. because I was reading people like Rilke and I just I just felt it felt beyond like what a human could do. And so I think that in some ways thinking of fiction felt um, more accessible to me, but I always retained that love of especially the kind of compression and attention to mm -hmm. language, which we think of um, mm -hmm. perhaps as being uh, at least a, a very important part of poetry. I mean, in terms of the sort of debate about fragmentary novels, I was just joking about this the other day with um, uh, Patricia Lockwood, Lockwood, who has a new book out called um, No One Is Talking About This, which is written in that style. I, I don't quite understand the fury about it. Like people have always loved big, long doorstop novels. I mean, that's mm. not going to go away. People that want to be immersed in a world and have 500 pages of it, you're you're going to have that. <laughs> no one's taking that from you. But for me, this style felt a little closer to thought to me, um, at least the way I think. And when I moved towards it with my second novel, Department, it was um, because I couldn't find time to write in these long um, things, but also because I always liked that more. I mm -hmm. just haven't quite, um, I'd worried because the, the danger with this style is if, if it's not done correctly, it, it looks, um, it seems random or it seems like um, you haven't taken time with it. <laughs> you know, I write such short books, but they take me a really long time because I feel like you have to you have to guard against that. In the same way, if you write longer novels, you might have to guard against wordiness or a certain kind of bagginess. Uh, what Henry James famously you know, said that it was a big baggy monster in the novel. Um, I don't really like baggy monster novels. I'm, I, I'm, I'm more like a sort of um, quicksilver um, thing that kind of hits, it, hits you with a bit of a glancing blow. Yeah, it's interesting because you're, you have, um... It's really beautiful language. And I keep thinking, well, it's like it's succinct or concise, but it compression is such a better word for it because you do have these, you know, um, you do have a little bit of a flourish to your writing as well. So it's a nice, it's a nice balance. Um, I also think like readers are, you know, I mean, not only from um, you know, writing over the years and getting to talk to readers, but also just from teaching. I mean, I feel like readers, um, are so much smarter than we sometimes give them credit for when we spell out every detail of mm -hmm. a background and we don't allow things to sort of be implied or gestured towards. Um, 
you know, I sometimes am irritating to my family because if we're watching a TV show, I know in certain kind of TV shows that if any detail is shown in the beginning, it's because it's going to have like this key, you know, like if somebody likes working on old clocks, you can bet that in this, you know, final scene, an old clock will need to be fixed. Um, but I feel like life feels more mysterious than that to me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the things that we're drawn to, the things that make an impression on us, um, have to be uh, touched on quite delicately in order to um, have that come through on the page. And I think as a reader, it was very exciting for me to read the book because you allowed me to fill in my thought processes in it. And I also, you know, it is a small book and you think you can just kind of breeze through it, but it's like, there's so much that you're kind of processing along the way. Um, you know, so I felt like Lizzie was in, was in my head, but also my thoughts were in there. It wasn't like the author just came in and took all my thoughts out of it, you know? <laughs> so it was really um, beautiful. And, you know, with your fragmentary process or these fragments, I wanted to know, I know in the New York Times Magazine feature that they did on you, they mentioned your boards and that it was a visual, like you, you put your, um, notes and so forth on these boards, but I was wondering if it, it is, a, if writing is in any part of visual process for you. Jenny, did we lose you? Looks like we lost Jenny for a minute. Hopefully she'll be coming back shortly. She may just have to sign back in. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Here she comes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Um, That's okay. I live a little bit out in the country, so every once in a while a wind gust will. will take <laughs> out. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. What did I what did I miss? <laughs> so so what I was asking you is, you know, in the New York Times um, magazine feature that they did on you, which was a wonderful piece. Uh, I wanted to know, you know, they talked about your boards that you had that you would pin your fragments too but I was wondering is there a vision do you is there like a visual component to the way you write I mean I know you're interested by other writers and poets but um you're also interested in the visual arts I mean mm -hmm. part of the article took place while you guys were walking through an exhibition of V.S. Selman's work mm -hmm. and so I was wondering if the visual arts play a role yeah. in your influences and so forth and um your research or it, how you visualize your characters or anything like that? Well, I'm, I'm very um, inspired by um, different visual artists. Um, I myself am not a very visual person. I'm very verbal. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the part that was shown in the New York Times article was um, every once in a while when I'm stuck as a writer, I will go ahead and just actually um, print out what I'm working on and cut it with scissors and put it um, either by boards like by character sometimes though it's by boards by like mysticism or it might be anecdotes about a particular thing and I do that partly because I've noticed that some of my friends who are um, you know painters or, or filmmakers or something they're much more open it seems to me to the idea of like chance operations that mm -hmm. by allowing for that element of something coming in that you don't know, um, you might get out of a, um, a rut. So one of the things I do, I'll, I'll grab it here, um, is I use, uh, I use these oblique uh, strategy cards sometimes, um, which were uh, Brian Eno. And oh, like I love Brian Eno. Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt made them. Yep. And you just turn one over, like this one just says, uh, go outside, shut the door. And it's one of these things that um, is meant to help you um, 
jolt yourself out of whatever kind of received ideas you are in. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, I'm always looking because I think I'm, I'm, I'm the opposite of a prolific writer. I'm always looking for ways to kind of um, question what I've done before and see if there might be, like one of the other oblique strategies, it just says gardening, not architecture. You know, oh, it's, just, nice. it's so lovely and oblique. And yet you kind of know exactly what it means if you're working on something and you can feel that you're like trying to make it too rigid and that yeah. you need to have like a different flow to it. So yeah. It's so kind of it's kind of like Yoko Ono's book, that little yellow book she did, the grapefruit I love book, that book with the instructions to go. And it, if you do any of them, it gives you a whole different perception. Of your I know, day, I often, I often of design to my students to do things like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like those kind of assignments that, you know, I think are maybe more common in um, art schools, you know, can be really fantastic to kind of, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really drawn to that. I'm, I'm drawn to like the, um, you know, the things that the Fluxus movement did or um, different performance artists uh, are really interesting to me because they often make something um, uh, like, I'm blanking on his name, the person who, um, Taiwanese artist, and he did, he, he photographed himself every single day punching a clock. Oh, on Kawara? Um, no, it's... No. Um, Boy, I don't know why it's just going okay. through my mind. But um, but what, one of the things that he did was he made time so uh, visible because he mm -hmm. starts with a very, very short hair. And then yes. every day he punches a time clock and you just see the pictures all in a row. But he also did a piece that was called the outdoor piece where he lived for a whole year uh, without going into any building, any structure. And I always feel like um, artists have a way, I think, of, of making something seen that mm -hmm. we may all recognize, but we haven't explicitly thought of. And so um, I'm just, I've always liked that kind of idea of like uh, what's in front of us, but that isn't easy to see. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, just mentioned your students. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how does your teaching work with your writing and are you influenced by what happens in the classroom and vice versa and so forth and how does well, teaching I mean, work into to your <laughs> life and what you do because um, you're well, a bard you're at bard college right now right i am and uh, certainly some of the library stories about things mm -hmm. that happen are actually you know more things that i've seen uh, as a teacher but i also spent a lot of time in the university library for a long time bard is down the road for me for a long time i didn't I wasn't a part of the faculty there, but I would go and I would use their library. And it was actually like wonderful to me because it was like being a ghost. Because if you use a university library where you work, you of course run into people and um, yeah. as lovely as that could be to socialize, you're not gonna get your work done. So I spent a lot of time there sort of as a, as a ghost in the library. And, um, and now that I'm teaching there, I mean, what I find mostly about teaching and why I like it is that it, especially as I get older, I'm 52, um, I feel like being able to um, see what people are thinking about that are a lot younger than you are. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's good to just shake you out of like maybe some of what would be um, ways that get kind of ossified. So I really enjoy that. I also find it emotionally very um it's just like a serious job, you know, like especially being a writing teacher is, is it, there's an element of it that is like being a therapist um, mm -hmm. because people often bring, you know, very uh, emotionally charged material to the class. And so um, sometimes I find that that is a little bit um, whatever I might've used for my own writing, I might use for teaching instead. So mm -hmm. if I have to find the right balance. For many years, I was adjuncting and working so many, like three or four jobs at once. And, and I didn't get much writing done. That's part of why my yeah. books take so long. But, but I have a nice balance right now. And I'm really feeling like it's, um, you know, being a writer is just like sitting alone in your room all day. And mm -hmm. uh, you have no idea for years if what you've done is any good. Teaching is, feels more immediate. You can feel if you get class. the feedback it's right away. Yeah, yeah. You can you can tell if you've missed the mark or if you if something's going well. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, a lot of artists have to balance that teaching and practice yeah. um, element. Um, uh, one of the things I, I know we're kind of um, getting close to where I want to open it up to the audience for questions, but I wanted to talk about kind of your, your epigraph that you have in the beginning and then also kind of, I don't know, your little epilogue with the website at the end mm -hmm. to kind of talk, use that to talk about collective action because, you know, it's... Um, I don't know if you want to read the uh, notes from the town meeting. Um, yeah, why don't I read that? Yeah, why don't you read that? Because I just, that made me laugh as soon as I read it, because I just felt like, oh my God, this is the last four years. <laughs> what have we been going through? <laughs> yeah. I feel like this is, um, this is also very, when we were talking earlier about like, what it's like to be, you know, someone that likes to go to libraries, like this little epigraph comes from a giant and mostly very dull book I read about a history of Puritans, but I saw this one bit and um, it was worth reading the whole book for it. Um, okay. Notes from a town meeting in Milford, Connecticut, 1640. Voted that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Voted that the earth is given to the saints. Voted that we are the saints. Um, <laughs> And I think that, I, I guess I loved that because it, it spoke so much, I think, to that uh, exceptionalism, that feeling um, not only of like mankind being somehow outside of nature or above the rest of the world, but also I think really very much to an American idea that mm -hmm. we'll somehow, um, uh, well, there's been such, I think, an important grappling, uh, in particular in the last year or two, with like what our history really is as a country, and and all those people that say things like, "That's not who we are." You know, there's a lot of people who are saying the America you're talking about, you know, never existed for um, for me and for um, my ancestors, or existed very in a flickering way. And so I kind of wanted to. I mean, I'm obviously like a white, middle-aged, um, middle-class person. And I, I wanted a little bit to interrogate um, just what it means to have yourself so central. Um, and I think that's one of the things that uh, Lizzie, Lizzie thinks about as she, as she goes farther. And she's not particularly, um, financially, she lives a pretty precarious life, but obviously, um, in other ways, um, you know, things are not as precarious for her as, as for many, many people in our country. So th that was kind of what I liked about that. And then in terms of the, the end of the book and the books that book, um, the, the way I sort of have a jumping off point, um, I think to explain it, uh, first, I'll just mention that the Lizzie's mentor who runs the podcast, um, she's a very sort of, um, well, she's she's been in working in climate things for a long time, and she's quite um, she's quite burnt out on it by the end. And at one point, Lizzie calls her and she says, "Oh, I can't talk to you right now. I'm I'm writing an article, and I have to put in the obligatory note of hope," which is really a thing if you read environmental <laughs> articles about climate change, where there's just a sudden weird tacked on thing to make you feel better. And so um, the novel ends at, at a, a certain point, but I made a website. Um, which is called Obligatory Note of Hope, because I did find that I myself became um, less doomy the longer I worked um, on this novel. Not because the situation isn't dire, but because I started to see examples of all the people that were working on it in a local level. And so I made a website that sh showed a couple examples of that, of that kind of collective action. And I also... Um, part of it is also called tips for trying times. And with that, I took things from other really difficult moments in history. I actually feel like I have to make a pandemic version now, but like, <laughs> you know, during the siege of Sarajevo, um, there's an oral history where one of the, the women says, you know, it's really important to still give gifts. So you might give your neighbor like a pie that was made really with just a little bit of flour and water but you tie it with a, a string because that's part of what makes us feel um, alive and human. And um, so there's a lot of things like that about 
that I had found in my readings. And it's a little bit of a, a commonplace book, I think, for um, for those ideas. So, so those are, I wanted it to be that if you don't want a note of hope, <laughs> mm -hmm. you don't have to go to it. That's why it's not integrated. But if you end thinking, well, what, what could I do? How does this dread translate into something? I, I wanted to sort of create a little portal for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was really lovely just the, the two kind of being the bookends mm -hmm. because it is about kind of groups of people coming together, mm -hmm. but the actions are very different. You know, yeah. one's about yeah. claiming and the other is about how do we get through this together? So it was kind exactly. of a nice arc. Yeah. And um, I continue, and you know, if you study anything about social movements, you know, it really, it, so much of the um, prepper ideas are about like being solo or being just with your family group. And there's a, there's a very sort of tribalism kind of quality to it, but that's just not really how humans have survived over the centuries. Mm -hmm. They've survived by making communities and helping out other people. And, you know, so I, I wanted to end it with some sense of what it might mean to not be in your own silo of dread. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, we do have we ha do have a couple questions. So um, let's see, it says, did you begin writing the novel with some of the science background already in mind or did the fic fictional aspects come first? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I began writing the novel, I think, um, I often do start kind of with an emotion in mind. And I knew that I was going to write about like anticipatory dread. Um, and so I knew that that was what was on my mind. To begin with, it was really just on my mind because I was getting older and I was just thinking about loss and about you know, losing people. But quite early in it, I, I don't know exactly how I fell down the rabbit hole of reading about um, it was a, it'd been a long time since I checked in on the climate climate facts. And uh, one of the, the frightening things I discovered is just how much faster than expected it was happening, how much the um, original sort of predictions had been too conservative. Mm -hmm. So once that started to happen, I really resisted writing about it for a while because I just thought it would make a bad book. And I'm, you know, I'm frankly selfish enough that I thought to myself, well, I don't want to write a terrible book. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not actually in, but the, the longer I, I kind of, it, it became an interesting challenge to me. And I especially was like, oh, it's all very earnest. And it, it feels very um, either um, very dense in terms of the information and somewhat impenetrable depending on your cast of mind, or it's just very um, often just, there's no humor. In, at all. And so I started to like have this little idea like, oh, I wish there was like activism for hypocrites, you know, and because um, that's very much what I am. And, um, and from that, I just started to imagine like, who would that character be? And, um, and it went from there. And you came up with Lizzie. <laughs> I came up with Lizzie. <laughs> Um, the other question is, do you find that people are overall acclimating to the discussion of climate change? Yes, I, I, I think that when I began this book, which is now about six, maybe even seven years ago, um, I found that many people in my circles who would talk about almost anything, um, that wasn't something that they really talked about. It wasn't that they didn't believe in it or that they didn't right. think it was going to happen, but it, it didn't. Um, it didn't come up, you know. And and one of the things I think that happened, I remember telling someone, you know, years and years ago, because it was something I'd spotted in my students. I said, you know, the generation is coming up right now. This is before Greta. Uh, we, you know, we sort of have that whole movement. I said they're really angry there's a really a righteous sense of rage about this world that they're being left. And they're thinking like, I don't even know if I can have kids in this world. And I said, and you know, you have to be ready to sort of answer the question like, well, well, what did you do? What well, did you do anything? And mm -hmm. so to me, even though it was obviously a very silly um, way to try to do something, I thought at least that I would write a novel about this as a way to figure out my own like ideas about it and also be able to you know say to my daughter 
yeah, I didn't just turn away. I didn't completely like say, well, we can't do anything because there's, you know, so that was really a change for me. Like to, when that became part of the public conversation, mm-hmm. you know, where she's like, how dare you? And people were like, I thought, oh, that's been going on for a long time. It just hadn't quite burst onto the stage in the same way. Yeah. Uh, somebody else had wanted to, oh wait, we have another question that came in, but I'm gonna ask, ask this one first. One of our library committee um, members was asking about the Extinction Rebellion. Mm, yeah. And whether you're involved in that or, you know. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Well, the Extinction Rebellion is a, a large group, uh, a worldwide group that is, um, it's based on the idea of like non-violent direct action, which, you know, most of us are familiar from like thinking of the civil rights movement or things mm-hmm. like that. Um, I am part of a subset of it, which is a writer's group. Mm-hmm. And, and what that is, is it's called Writers Rebel. Uh, I didn't make up the name, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but um, it's really about like how as writers and as people that work kind of in that industry, um, how can we use what skills we have to, one of the tenets of Extinction Rebellion is um, admit that it's an emergency you know, like stop. And it's funny because I am just not a joiner and there's parts of XR that are very, you know, are just not quite me. Um, But I really felt like it was an interesting group in terms of like, um, they moved the needle with the conversation about it. Um, And so I, I've sent a little note of solidarity when it started in the UK to other, uh, the writers that were doing it. It was people like Zadie, Zadie Smith and um, uh, Margaret Atwood and uh, some UK writers that all were saying, and and they, they wrote me back rather promptly and said, oh, we need someone to start <laughs> a branch of it in, in New York. And I of course said, oh no, <laughs> that is not for me. Um, but, you know, I was lucky enough to, um, be able to partner with some people that did know what they were doing and were really skilled activists and, and advocates. And, and, you know, some of the, this all happened seriously like two months before the pandemic. So it's been an interesting process of getting it up and running again. Um, but, you know, we're just doing a big, for example, a, a climate read series at the Brooklyn Public Library, which has been uh, just a way to talk about these issues through the lens of uh, a fiction and have it really be open to um, anyone in the community that that wants to, you know, wants to learn more. Mm-hmm. So if somebody wanted to find out about it, did they just look up Extinction yeah, look Rebellion? Up Extinction Rebellion, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and, or Writers Rebel. Um, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's starting to have you know, more little, it, it, it's starting to have a little more little um, groups in different parts of the world, yeah. And there's also a couple other things that I mentioned uh, I, on my obligatory note of hope, I, I mentioned the Sunrise Movement, which is, um, they, it's a youth movement and youth led movement. So if you're not a youth, they, they would like you very much to give them money and support them, but don't, don't try to join them. And then there's another one that I think is kind of, it sounds a little hippy dippy, but it's really quite lovely. This transition town idea, which is about what can your actual community do that is kind of, um, you know, just a lot of things that are about um, gardening or having a tool library or really all these things are on the library idea. Mm -hmm. And they're just sending them to other resources. So that was started in England and has now uh, is now worldwide. Fantastic. Um, We do have a question that came in about the Department of Speculation. So uh, they say it's a magnificent, magnificent book, which I agree. And did you uh, write it in a linear way or in fragments that you needed to piece together like you did with weather? Yeah, I wrote it in fragments. Um, And it, it, one of the things that, you know, I, I think I always really like to think about that. I think it was E.L. Doctorow who said that writing a novel um, is like uh, driving down a dark road and you can only see as far as your headlights. Now, some people are not like that at all when they write a novel. They have big charts and they are, um, you know, plot very far ahead. And but But I don't. And so for me, it's always like trying to figure out what 
why am I drawn to these these moments and and what do they add up to? Because um, as those of you who've been here since the beginning of the thing, I'm not very good at summarizing my own novels. Um, in fact, uh, anyone who is involved with me is always like trying to prevent that. But with Department of Speculation, it sounds particularly um, tedious, you know, because it's about like a woman in Brooklyn who's like, married but there's trouble in the marriage and she kind of gave up her art career and it just sounds I remember thinking like oh that's not the kind of book I would read but um I was interested when I was writing it on how much you can you pull in to a seemingly you know domestic novel or basic novel and how how much can come in from other um other lines of thought other philosophical traditions um so that was fun to play around with. And it definitely took shape um, from, from little pieces that I later learned how they fit together. Uh, what, um, what we had another question that came in earlier, which was um, you've written several children's books. And this person wanted to know if you are um, thinking about writing a children's book that might address some of the climate emergency issues or? Yeah, I hadn't thought of doing that. Um, I think, you know, the children's books were a little bit of an accident for me. I just kind of fell into them because, um, you know, some, someone asked me if I would like to do it. And what they, I guess they share with my novels is that, because they're picture books, um, although I don't draw them thank God. Um, but I've had these beautiful <laughs> illustrators for each of them that have done them. But what they kind of share is that if you're writing a picture book, you have to compress quite a bit of story into these small. And, and for those of us who have children or just children in your lives, you know that the difference between reading a picture book that makes you want to tear your hair out mm -hmm. uh, and one that you sort of enjoy the language or the humor of is huge because you know, you're going to read it a zillion times to that right. child in your life. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I think um, it's been a really fun experience to write them and I will probably write another one. Um, but initially they were kind of a, a bridge when I couldn't, I couldn't write things in longer form. Um, so I don't know if I quite have the, the skill to bring a topic as big as climate, the climate crisis to that small a form to, you know, 200 novels was already me, like uh, 200 pages was already me, you know, compressing it at, at as much as I could. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to circle it back around to weather and um, ask you about the last paragraph because mm -hmm. I was, I was actually reminded of your last paragraph when I was at the dentist recently, because there's the whole <laughs> thing about the mouth guard, right? Mm -hmm. And my dentist asked me, have you been wearing your night guard? And I was like, yes, but what's the urgency? And she said, there's actually a phenomenon with the pandemic that people have been grinding and clenching their teeth so severely that they're splitting them in half. I, I have heard of this. Okay, yes. so I was wondering if you had, and you know, yeah. it just seems such a funny thing to bring up at the ending of no, the book. No, because I, I've, I've heard, I heard of someone that that happened to that I know, and then I heard another person saying that their dentist had said that, because basically it's just, you, you know, there's something about the pandemic that it, I think for people that are, um, sort of riding it out a little more at home than other mm -hmm. people who are in the essential worker category, it can feel like maybe it's wrong to um, talk about how traumatic it is, right? Because there's always other people you can point to that are having a much harder time, but it's historically traumatic. <laughs> like, like think if there's any other time where what you know as normal life has gone away so quickly and also where everyone around you is under stress. So if before you might have one friend who was having a really hard time or someone had a cancer diagnosis or someone's getting worse, now everyone's life is fracturing. And so I think the part where people are telling themselves all day, well, I don't, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as, you know, these people were working as nurses or delivery people. 
their their minds may be telling them that, but at night their body's just like. <laughs> you know? So so uh, yeah, I really I think I think that that really resonates with me. So with our last question, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, what have you been reading recently, and what is I mean, do you have your next project? Um, well, I'm I'm in the beginning stages of a new novel. Um, uh, I can't, uh, I mean, since I can't even talk about them very well when they're done, I, I, will, <laughs> yeah. I, will, I will spare you. I will spare, because one of the things when you talk about a novel at the very beginning of it, you almost invariably leave thinking, well, that doesn't sound very good at all, does it? And <laughs> and you, at a very early stage that can kind of like collapse you. So, so I'm superstitious that way, but, um, but yeah, I'm, my daughter uh, is actually going to go back to in-person school and I will soon have a little more time to write. Um, but what I've read recently um, was a book I was just talking about. The, um, oh, That's uh, my dog. I'm going to mute real quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, hi. My dog has already tried to get through the door several times. So um, if, if she hears barking, she'll be especially drawn in. Um, but I, I read um, No One Is Talking About This, which I thought was a really, really interesting book. And um, I am just about to reread this book called Fever Dream, which is by an Argentinian writer, um, Samantha Schweblin, which I think is a really um, fascinating and very strange book kind of an eerie story about um, a mother, you know, two neighbors who are mothers and um, something that goes wrong with one of their children. But it's written in this very, um, I just, it's its sort of an uncanny story. It's almost like a ghost story, even though it's not exactly. And um, so that, that really stuck with me too. That's wonderful. Well, this has been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for all your time and your fabulous, fabulous work. Oh, and uh, well, we, we so just much. really appreciate you being part of the Library Foundation program tonight. Well, thank you so much for talking with me, Meg. Thank you, Kunga. Um, thank you so much to the Newport Beach um, Public Library Foundation for inviting me. It's really, really been a great and uh, just a pleasure to talk with you. And thank you all for coming. Great. See you later. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.